Welcome to The Stone Wolves, a Galactic Football League novella. Written by Scott Sigler and J.C. Hutchins. Performed by Scott Sigler. The Stone Wolves is also available as a Kindle ebook from Amazon.com or as a full-length audiobook from Audible.com. To find links for those items, go to scottsigler.com slash thestonewolves, one word. Ohio gozaimas, junkies. Holy crap, we are almost done with the Stone Wolves. This is episode 32. It all ends with episode number 33. Did you dig last week's action-packed pinnacle? Well, now we are on the downslope as the Oleron crew tries to recover from the events at MT-734. This is the second last episode. That means our world-famous, presidential-endorsed, award-winning Q&A episodes are on the way. We will be doing those Q&A episodes live on the Sigler in Place live stream on Wednesday, May 11th, and Wednesday, May 18th, both at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. So send your questions into info at emptyset.com. That is I-N-F-O at E-M-P-T-Y-S-E-T dot com. Email the question as text, or if you're getting jiggy with it, you can send a phone video also to info at emptyset.com. Make the video vertical and make it 30 seconds or less. Please keep it simple. Get out. We're going to have a whole bunch of them. We'd love to see you on our cast. We would also have to love you join us for those live stream Q&A episodes. Sigler in Place is a fun, boozy hangout with a real girl herself, me, and a whole bunch of junkies in the chat room. We do it every Wednesday, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. You can find links to join us on Twitch, YouTube, Facebook Live, or Twitter at scottsigler.com slash livestreams. Let's get you caught up on the story so far, and then we're all going to pretend we're the Detroit Lions and make a horrible pick in the NFL draft. Previously on The Stone Wolves, the surviving members of the Oleron crew leave the horror of MT-734 behind them, but they take with them a souvenir that could change the course of history. Epilogue Killian stared at the rust-speckled, soot-streaked, dented white shipping container, still secure atop the battered flatbed truck. Partially secured anyway, some of the chains had snapped. Aya, Redwire, Zan's walking schmeck, Beans, and Blank stared at it as well. Aya, right foot on the deck, left leg bent and foot dangling, leaned heavily on Zan's schmeck. Red wire stood on his own power, barely swaying slightly. Beans' fur had burned patches in it, blackened flesh beneath. He looked so tiny, so fragile. Killian wondered how they'd survived. Most likely, that's what all of them were wondering. Two of the trailer's big tires had chunks missing. The whole frame looked slightly twisted, as if it were a washcloth that someone had just begun to wring. Tiny pebbles of black volcanic rock dotted the top of the cargo container, the exposed areas of the flatbed, the torn roof of the truck cab, all from magma spray that had cooled before raining down. How close had they all come to death? Truck is t -t -t toast, Bean said. Can't sell it. Can I have it? Vehicle parts could be traceable, even after Beans did his thing. Considering the players involved, Killian didn't want to take any chances. No, he said. As soon as we're out of punch space, we jettison the truck and its cargo. Redwire turned, wincing at a stab of pain from one of his injuries. Don't even think about it, he said. We need that thing. Killian's oldest friend still wore his combat armor, Sans helmet. The man's arm was a ruin. It's my ship, Killian said hearing the exhaustion in his own words. I won't have that abomination on board. Red stared at the trailer and its cargo. The man had been through so much. He needed to be in a rejuve tank, again and not here, arguing about the most obvious decision in the history of obvious decisions. Just give me a little time to arrange things, he said. I'll get it off the ship. Aya glared at him. And do what with it? 
You think we've forgotten you're with the shucking Zoroastrian guild? You bastards will try to use it on Kretorok or something. She, too, needed to be in the rejuve tank. Again. Despite her helmet, which she'd tossed across the cargo bay, she'd somehow taken a blow to the head. Her left eye was puffing shut, swelling on her forehead and chin from impacts that had slammed her head hard against the helmet's padding. Even with her armor on, Killian could see her right knee had swollen considerably. Red stared at the battered cargo container, as if just looking away from it, even for an instant, might make it detonate. Detonate, or whatever it was, this thing did when it killed a planet. Three crunches got away, he said, his voice soft, level. If we're going to find them, or at least prepare for them, we need to know how this one works. You destroy it, and we lose that chance. We can't trust any government to take this and not turn it into a super weapon of their own. Once this thing leaves my control, we lose the ability to make sure it's properly studied. Killian, all of you, please. I will get this thing off of your ship when we punch in. You have my word. Killian tried to block out thoughts of Ionath, or any of the dozens of other populated planets he'd visited, being wiped out by one of those weapons. He tried to, but he couldn't. And Red was right about turning this over to a government. To any government. Killian had seen firsthand the horrors that could be hidden away and covered up forever. All right, Killian said. We'll give you a little time to get it off the ship. Aya shook her head. Uh, no, we vote on this. I vote we give Goldman time, Zan Schmeck said. There is too much at stake. I support his milkiness, Bean said. Aya closed her eyes, the fatigue and pain hanging on her like the chewed-up armor she still wore. Fine, she said. If that's how it is, that's how it is. No threats to leave the ship if she didn't get her way. No effort to convince everyone to agree with her. She didn't want the cruncher on board, didn't want to let Redwire take it but she was going along with the vote of her crewmates. That truck isn't stable, Redwire said. We need to open it up and see what we can see. After that crazy drive out of there, the insides could be shattered for all we know. Killing remembered Thorne's circular hand patterns to open the forest green cargo container back on MT-734. If they opened this one, was there a chance it would detonate? Yes. Maybe a small chance. Screw it. It was better to have all the intel than some of it. Beans, Killian said. Get the container off the truck. We open it up, see what we can see. The Sklorno scurried along the flatbed, examining damage to the securing cables. He slid beneath the truck. I aside and shook her head, disgusted. This is nader stupid, she said. But if it blows up because we're mucking about with it, then I guess that's one less world-killing weapon in the galaxy. Which, Killian thought, wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Beans came out from under the truck, his singed black fur standing on end. Good news, Skipper! A friend came along for the ride! He pointed a tentacle to somewhere under the flatbed. Killian bent at the waist, wincing as he did. When had he gotten so old? And looked underneath to where the sclerno indicated. There, two segmented arms wrapped around the undercarriage structure was Peaches, unmoving, as still as the trailer itself. The other two arms held a thickly bundled void cloak tight against its dented round shell. Not just dented, cracked. The watchbot must have climbed in there, and locked its legs in place before one of the hundreds of jarring bumps smashed it against a boulder. I'll be damned, Killian said. Aya, was this your doing? She held Zan's mismatched arm, then bent, carefully, enough to look under the truck. I told Peaches to come to me when it could, then I forgot about it, Aya said. She stood straight again, wobbled. It must have caught up to us right when we drove out of the facility and hit the brakes before we drove away. The Void Cloak. In a way, 
Killian had hoped it was gone forever, a talisman of his hated past lost to the sands of time. Now that he saw it, though, he was glad for it. The Orphaner and the Void Cloak were the trappings of the killer, and the killer was him. He couldn't change the past, but maybe he could use those tools to help build a better future. Somehow. Beans, get that container down and be careful. I leaned against Zan's walking schmeck, watched Beans operate the lift jack to remove the cargo container from the ruined flatbed trailer. It was like leaning against a friend. Sort of. I hoped that maybe someday she and Zan could be actual friends, not just crewmates. But Aya wanted a lot of things in life, and she knew most of them would never happen. The adrenaline was wearing off. Correction had worn off, completely, and whatever pain Aya's body and mind had blocked during the escape had returned tenfold. A cracked rib made every breath a dance with possible agony. Was her knee broken? Maybe parts of it were. Her kneecap felt like a block of ice-cold steel, heavy and dense. She didn't dare put the foot down, lest her calf call her horrible names using the language of excruciating pain to communicate. While in the EFT, while scrambling for her life, she'd managed to walk on the leg, put weight on it. So if it was broken, hopefully it wasn't badly broken. Aya, Zan Schmeck said. We need to get you to the med bay. Aya snorted. Surprise, surprise. As often as I'm there, why don't I just move in all my things and call it my quarters? Zan didn't respond. Her schmeck stood there, a rock to lean on. It was only at that moment that Aya realized Zan's metal hand was at the small of her back, holding her up. Jokes aside, Aya needed the med bay. She needed the auto dock. She needed time in the rejuve tank. And, for sure, she needed a shower wanted to feel the light sting of nanites scraping the sweat and blood and filth from her skin. Now that things had calmed down, she was aware of the stink slipping out of her combat armor. It didn't smell as bad as the day she'd spent hiding in that dumpster, though. She could handle it a little while longer. Zan, Aya said, do you think that thing is gonna blow up when we open it? I would not begin to guess. Let us hope it does not. You don't seem that worried about it. Worrying is inefficient, Zan said. All creatures die eventually, Aya. Well, wasn't that comforting? The lift jack raised the container off the flatbed. Skipper drove the truck out from underneath. Drove was a bit of an overstatement. The shuddering, wobbling 15-meter trip showed it was more miracle than engineering that they had escaped the facility and the, what, the black hole the planet had become? An entire world gone. Beans worked the rig, lowering the white container toward the deck. Maybe Goldman was right. Someone needed to study that thing. It was a conspiracy theory come to life, yet far worse than the visions created by paranoid, fractured imaginations. A weapon that killed planets. Goldman stood there, waiting, still in his black armor, his left arm hanging limp. He'd removed the sealant film Blank had wrapped around it. The armor's gel supply seemed exhausted. Blood dripped, slowly, to the deck. Aya's trip to the rejuve tank would have to wait as Goldman needed it more. So much death. Viden, gone. I had barely known the hurrah. Fanaka, as well. The woman had been forced into doing horrible things, into betraying her friends. Why? Because someone with power wanted more of the same. Why was it always the rich and the powerful who made others do their dirty work? Why was it always the rich and the powerful who made people fight, made them die, corrupted them? Thorne had forced Fanaka to do horrible things, just like the Fafner Project had forced Aya to do horrible things. Aya didn't mind that people got rich. Money didn't automatically make someone bad. 
It was what they did with that wealth that was the kicker. Using that wealth or power to control others, to manipulate others, to force others to do things against their will, that was what she hated. And now, after Fanaka's death, she hated it even more. Beans had a deft touch with the lift jack. The white container touched down on the deck with barely a clang. The lift array rose up, and Beans returned it to its resting spot in the cargo hold's ceiling. Skipper and Goldman approached the container. We can get closer, if you like, Zan Schmeck said. I and Zan were only ten meters away. If the thing went off, maybe that was enough room to see Skipper and Goldman spaghettified first, or perhaps everyone would die in the same instant. Didn't really matter. With the Oleron and punch space, there was nowhere else in the ship worth going. Right here is fine, Aya said. Skipper and Goldman stood at the container's side. It's your ship, Goldman said. You want to do it? He sounded so weak. He looked one breath away from death. Hell no, Skipper said. This is your moment, I guess. Have at it. Beans came scurrying over to be at Goldman's side. I wondered what it was like to get to see your god face to face. To hang out with him. Totally, Bakuna. Goldman took a step forward, wobbled, then fell. Skipper's hand shot out, caught Goldman before he hit the ground. How could someone that big be that fast? Uh, I'm all right, Goldman said, although he sounded anything but all right. Killer, would you mind doing the honors? I'll just, uh, I'll just sit here for a little bit. Once you actually help me sit, that is. Skipper nodded, carefully lowered Goldman to his butt. Without an invitation, or before someone could say no, perhaps, Beans scurried into Goldman's lap. I will protect you, your milkiness. Skipper reached to grab Beans. He's fine, Goldman said, staying Skipper's hand. He can sit here with me. He's earned it. The quarterback, ex-quarterback, by the looks of that mangled arm, spoke softly, his words barely audible. The patents Thorn made might work anywhere, killer, but I suggest you kneel down so you're at the same level he was. Skipper turned to the container, not with the same speed he'd used to catch Goldman, but fast enough to make Aya think he knew he had to do this quick before he changed his mind. The man she knew as Killian Peterson knelt at the halfway point along the side of the white container. Just as Thorne had, he patted his palms against the side three times, paused, tapped once, paused, then tapped four times. Skipper then rotated his palms outward in small circles. Smears of Goldman's blood marked those paths. Aya held her breath, waiting for Skipper to stop once he saw the thin smears of red, wondering what would happen if he didn't finish the combination of gestures, but Skipper didn't slow. Maybe he'd seen enough blood in his days that it didn't bother him. He finished the next two circles, then backed away. There was a moment where Aya stared at the blood streaks, wondering if Skipper would order them cleaned away or just leave them. Then a glowing blue line appeared, running from the top of the container straight down the side to the bottom. At least the doors weren't broken. San, she said, can I take you up on your offer to help me to medbay? The Schmeck head turned, as if it had real eyes that needed to look directly at Aya. You do not want to see the interior of the container? Aya closed her eyes. No. I've seen enough horrors for one day. Very well, Zan said. Aya felt the walking Schmeck's arm gently pull tighter around her waist. As they left the hold, Aya saw blue-white light reflecting off every shiny surface, and she heard Beans squeal with delight. And that was nice. At the end of it all, at least someone was happy. You have been listening to The Stone Wolves, a GFL novella, written by Scott Sigler and J.C. Hutchins, performed by Scott Sigler. 
Follow Scott on Twitter and at Instagram where he is at Scott Sigler and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Scott Sigler. The Stone Wolves was directed by A. Sigler, engineered by Steve Rickyberg. Copyright 2021 Empty Set Entertainment. Theme music is the song Battle Cry by the band Super Weapon. <laughs>